I'm Dan Aldridge, founding partner of Asbury Investor Relations and creator of the Share Series. I'm pleased to have Juliana Patera, director of uh, Investor Relations with Verano here with me today to discuss all the exciting things happening, not only in the industry, but in particular with what's going on with Verano. So, so Juliana, it's been about six months since we talked to you guys last, so would love to just kind of get a brief overview of where the business is and what's happened in that six months. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much, Dan, for having me, excited to, to keep sharing the story of Verano. So, um, you know, the strategy remains the same. So we're targeting limited license states for our operations, uh, ideally where it's a medical only market and target vertical operations uh, before maybe any adult use legislation happens. So we feel this best positions us, um, you know, before that flip to adult use. Um, so we're not starting from scratch. We're just ramping up operations, including pending acquisitions. We've got active operations in 16 states, uh, vertically integrated with cultivation in 14 of those. And we're at 118 dispensaries. Um, two active or sorry, two pending acquisitions. Uh, one that gives us deeper uh, access to Nevada and one that gives us vertical operations in New York, Minnesota, and New Mexico. We're very excited about New York uh, and Minnesota. New York is expected, no surprise, to be quite a large market. And upon close in Minnesota, we will have one of only two licenses to operate for the state. So we're really excited about Minnesota as well. And you know, before we go deeper, just a little bit of background for those new to the Verano story. Um, as you maybe noticed, our ticker is not you know, NASDAQ or NYSE because we're cannabis operators in the US. We are traded on a Canadian exchange and we just went pub uh, public in February of last year. Um, so unfortunately, since then, the entire industry has been under a lot of pressure. The industry saw a run up after Biden was elected. Uh, we believe on positive sentiment that there would be some federal legislation you know, happening shortly after that. Um, and, but unfortunately, the industry has traded down since then. Um, we, we believe that's due to little progress on the legislation front. Our industry is heavily retail traded, so we believe shares tend to trade on sentiment uh, more than fundamentals as it currently stands. But on founding, you know, founded in 2014 by George Arcos, a successful entrepreneur, he previously built companies in hospitality, construction, and logistics. Uh, and that enabled him to lay out a blueprint for the business and just start building from there. We are headquartered in Chicago and we have active operations, uh, as I mentioned, including pending acquisitions across 16 states. And we target vertical operations, which means we're both growing um, and wholesaling, as well as selling direct to consumers through our dispensaries, our Zenleaf branded um, dispensaries. And in most states um, in our dispensaries, we're actually selling both our own products uh, alongside some of our, our peer products. But um, you know, while this isn't an easy environment for really anyone to operate in, we're keeping our heads down and focusing on the business and we're extremely excited about the future. Yeah, so thanks for the overview and definitely very helpful, you know, on the general nature of the update for people who haven't uh, done any research on the company. So let's talk about the regulatory front. You know, obviously that's one of the biggest overhangs on the stock. And so just from a, a high level perspective, can you talk about states where you have the biggest challenges, right? And to the extent that you can provide kind of updates on where we are with that, you know, where are we moving in different states? Is there anything near term versus long term? Yeah, um, you know, most recently New Jersey went uh, adult use. That was uh, late April, so we were, you know, excited about that. Where we think that'll be a very strong state for us in our, in our portfolio, and so far, um, that's what we've seen some some strong growth there. So, um, you know, besides that, we're we're actually focusing or we're seeing a little more momentum, I should say, on the federal end. Uh, you know, while there are a few states that we think have some solid potential to turn adult use in the, we would say, near to midterm, namely, namely like a Pennsylvania, uh, Florida, um, we're seeing some good federal uh, progress. So, you know, while the SAFE Act was stripped out from the Competes Act uh, a few weeks back, um, there still seems a really strong desire, especially from the left, um, to get something done soon. But, you know, that we're seeing some across the aisle work is probably what's most promising. Um, there's a handful of proposals out there. Um, so many that honestly, sometimes it's tough, tough to keep track of. I mean, just last week, an additional bill was put for, forward and this one was bipartisan um, to provide safe harbor for financial institutions that conduct business with cannabis companies. So this one we, we think could pave the way for even a possible uplist um, to a, a US exchange. So. Overall, you know, very happy with uh, the recent environment. However, you know, we always like to point out we're still running a, a really strong business today without any regulatory help. You know, while 
it would be very welcomed. Um, you know, we're we're still operating successfully. Uh, you know, as things stand today. Okay, so let's drill down a, a little bit and talk about why you operate in certain states versus others. You know, I think it's important for people new to the story to understand the differences in the nature of the licenses by state. Absolutely. So, um, you know, as I, I throw this term out a lot, limited license state, and, and what that mean is, means is, you know, really just what it sounds like. So we target states that essentially limit the number of operators in their state. So it's a little unusual because I think most businesses, you know, or industries typically would uh, prefer less, you know, local or, or state government involvement. We actually almost prefer the opposite. We think it keeps, um, you know, the environment just operating much more smoothly. Um, you know, you look at a state like California, for example, uh, something that we're just not interested, you know, right now today. It's, it's a really big market for the U.S., um, honestly, for the world. Um, but it, it's there's such a large gray market that is able to uh, operate there with with no oversight. There's a very large number of dispensaries that just pop up shop without any license, and and they look legitimate to consumers. Consumers would never know, but they're they're operating you know really without any legality. So we actually prefer states um, that restrict. So for example, you know New Jersey, I mentioned that just went adult use. Each operator can hold a license to cultivate and they can open and operate a maximum of three dispensaries per the state. So, um, you know, it's limiting the influx of dispensaries and supply in the state. And it, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's the, the market that we would ideally target and prefer to operate in. Yeah. So we actually have a question from the audience and it actually deals with New Jersey. So we'll okay. stick on that and really talk about retail. But what is the process and the timing from when a state passes adult use to where an adults can actually buy it in a retail store? And is it different by state, I imagine? It's extremely different by state. And, um, you know, candidly, it's, it's almost impossible to predict even New Jersey, the way uh, kind of that legislation was initially framed uh, was that adult use sales were supposed to start August of last year. So, you know, we invested ahead of that and made sure we were pretty much up and running to meet that demand and then you know, we were seeing that kind of slowly kick down the road, unfortunately, and then, you know, kind of a February deadline past that, and then ultimately um, this April deadline, uh, which which finally enabled uh, operators to, to sell to, uh, you know, those 21 and over. So it's uh, it varies a lot by market. It, it kind of depended on how the state had structured the program, um, how they wanted to roll it out. Um, we're seeing some, some new states uh, that are legalizing now, implementing sometimes, um, partnerships with uh, those that had been impacted by uh, cannabis in a negative way previously. So they're called social equity partnerships, um, ensuring maybe those operators are able to get their business off the ground as well. So there's there's a lot of new factors coming to play. And it's it's I would say it's definitely not cookie cutter. Um, I would say traditionally what, what they're aiming to, to do is, is open doors within a year or so of pass of you know passing that legislation for the state. But Again, it's just, it's so t tough to predict and, um, you know, we kind of always expect to be caught off guard sort of in this industry. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so sticking with retail, and so you talked about the number of retail stores you guys have, what does what the, the roadmap look like? You know, are you guys planning to open a certain amount of stores per year? Do you have a long-term goal in mind? Yeah, so um, including pending ac acquisitions, we've got over a million square feet of cultivation in 118 dispensary dispensaries. Um, really no specific long-term goal in mind as we keep that a little in flux based on what we see in demand. So right now uh, we're able to, or we have uh, license to open a few more stores in each of Pennsylvania and West Virginia. Those are both med only markets right now. And in Florida, technically the way that state is structured, we have runway to open an unlimited amount of stores. So Florida is a little neat, unique in that it actually, um, it, it kind of forces the operator to be 100% vertical, which, you know, obviously is, is great for us, but yeah. um, as long as we have a you know, cultivation that's able to supply our shelves, we can open as many as we want. Obviously, you know, we're not going to just open one in every corner. So we do this in a measured approach, but uh, we're opening, you know, alongside with demand and hoping that adult use is on the horizon. So trying to ensure we're, uh, you know, prepared for that, but um, yeah, no, no specific target, you know, built into the, the company strategy, really. It's just 
working alongside the demand that we see in, in preparing for that. So let's talk about like the per store economics a little bit. Can you share what, what is the cost to open a new store? And then what, what's the payback period on something like that? Cost is, uh, you know, with, inf with uh, construction inflation, it's gone up a bit, but generally about half a million to a million to open a store. And it's going to depend on kind of the state dynamics and economics, but generally we would expect a payback period in under two years. Okay. And so let's talk a little bit about branding and products in particular. You know, obviously Verano has done a really nice job positioning itself as a premium brand. And so talk a little bit about, you know, what it takes to do that. You know, is this positioning entrenched, you know, across geographies? Are there geographies where it's not and you have an opportunity? Yeah, so uh, to your point, we, we kind of tout ourselves as a premium flower producer. We grow all of our flower indoors, which helps us control the quality and consistency across markets, uh, something that's candidly very difficult to achieve. Um, as a reminder, in this industry, you cannot ship products across state lines, so we have to operate you know, what we're selling in Florida, we grow in Florida, what we sell in New Jersey, we got to, you know, grow in New Jersey. So um, because we do all this indoors, though, that helps us refine our output and helps avoid, you know, need for pesticides or, you know, prevents, helps prevent, you know, a pest invasion and, and things like that. So our quality is, is pretty consistent across geographies because of this. However, there are a few markets in which we have yet to introduce our Verano brand and strains. So there is opportunity there. Uh, for example, in Pennsylvania, uh, we entered that state through a, an acquisition of a cultivator. So until recently, we were selling only that cultivator's branded items and wholesaling that into the state. But we've introduced our Verano strains in our, in our facilities. We're growing those, and we expect to be able to wholesale that soon. So we're excited about introducing Verano brand to Pennsylvania. And you know, similar story in Florida. Um, great partners in Florida. Um, that we acquired, but we are starting to grow and roll out our Verano strains in Florida as well. So we're excited about those prospects. Yeah. So another question I was going to have was around localized assortment, but it sounds like it's pretty localized yeah, by geography. Um, is, is that a, and this is a question that we got uh, from the audience earlier too, but is that a longer term, you know, piece of the strategy? Are there economies of scale to be had in consolidation as federal regulation comes together? Yeah, you know, there's there's uh, pros and cons there. So, um, you know, we're we're one of the few uh, multi-state operators that owns all of our cultivation facilities, meaning we didn't enter into any sale leasebacks. So, should federal legislation pass that, uh, you know, in the wording enables um, interstate commerce, um, which candidly we we think is a little unlikely, and it's for a few reasons. But should that happen, um, we have the ability to sell our real estate, walk away, and open a, a very large facility, a national. facility, facility and, and maybe, um, you know, wholesale all from there. However, there are some, you know, benefits to doing it locally. Our, you know, transport costs are much lower. Um, and, you know, there's a lot, given that it's cultivation, it's, it's, it's nicer to maybe only maintain a few hundred thousand square feet at a time versus, you know, a massive um, facility. So we kind of like keeping it a little local for that reason. And there's also limited edition, you know, strains that we're growing in markets. So it kind of keeps a buzz there. But um, there's definitely an opportunity. Um, it's, it's more, we're kind of seeing how any legislation would, would be set up and, and framed. So, um, we're, we're preparing the business and kind of hedging it that way to be available, to be, you know, ready to, uh, operate successfully in either environment. Okay. So back to the premium positioning. Mm -hmm. So I assume with that comes, you know, some pricing power. So obviously we're entering into a very uncertain time with the economy you know, possible recession, you know, so can you talk about that? You know, is pricing static across states, right? Have you seen pressure in any certain markets? You know, and what true pricing power do you have? Yeah, so we try our best to avoid any pricing wars or significant uh, discounting with our, our premium tier brand. Um, as you mentioned with inflation, uh, you know, there's certainly some pressure on consumer wallets. So sort of to combat this, we introduced earlier this year, our good, better, best um, kind of product tiered strategy. And this will help kind of insulate that premium tier uh, on pricing. So our goal there is to really not heavily discount that, keep that, you know, perceived as a very high uh, quality premium qu uh, product. And then if needed, we can toggle with pricing and discounts on that mid and lower tier, uh, those products. But to your point, it's not quite static yet across the country, um, you know, particularly in the West where there are less restrictive 
license regimes, um, it's we're seeing stronger pricing pressure. Pressure, and you know, candidly, we're not fully immune to it. We have operations in Arizona and Nevada, and um, you know, I think given that it's proximity to California, where there's a lot of pricing pressure there, um, we're seeing a little bit of that flow into you know some of our footprint. So um, it's it's certainly not static yet. I, I think over time the industry will get there. Um, but you know what we're doing now is just focusing on areas of the business that we think deserve the most reinvestment of our time and money. So for example, building out further, further cultivation in Pennsylvania and Florida ahead of any adult use legislation. So let's talk a little bit about your, your raw input costs. Have you seen any inflation impacts there? And I mean, not necessarily to Verano in particular, but for the industry as a whole. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're in a unique spot in the industry as we're seeing both some pricing pressures in certain markets and, you know, alongside inflation. So um, we, you know, as an industry, I would say it's safe to say they're, they're seeing some, some pricing uh, or some inflation uh, through the supply chain, but, um, you know, we're doing our best to protect our premium brand and, um, you know, trying to capture some of those consumers down the value ladder, as, to, as I discussed with those new um, product tiers. So, so trying to capture some more of those consumers that may not have always been able to afford our top premium uh, line with more of this mid and, and lower tier line as well. Okay. So let's transition to capital allocation for a little bit. And specifically, you mentioned m and you know, and the work that you guys have done there. At a high level, can you talk about how you guys think about m and you know, in terms of going deeper into an existing footprint versus going into new markets? You know, are you targeting targeting certain assets? You know, talent, geographies, you know, all all of the above. I'd say it starts with geography. Um, you know, the the state has such an impact on how that market's going to operate. So that's probably first and foremost where we're going to look for new assets. Um, I should probably first preface this with: Look, we had an extremely acquisitive 2021. We announced 15 acquisitions. Um, and you know, we're not expecting 2022. Obviously, we're halfway through the year. You know to be as acquisitive as it was last year. Um, that said, we do keep our eyes open for, to remain select, selectively acquisitive for certain opportunities. So I would say it starts with the state. And then, uh, you know, certainly the team is a, is a strong component, especially on the cultivation side. Uh, we've had a few acquisitions recently that really emphasize the importance of this. So CT Pharma, we closed on earlier this year. This gave us cultivation and wholesale in Connecticut. And um, I mean, the leaders there are absolutely incredible, very talented. We're going to be utilizing them to help uh, build up operations in you know, other states, kind of Northeastern um, that we plan to, to grow as well. So finding talented people in this industry is extremely important. You know, as you can imagine, it's not as easy to put out um, you know, a job posting for somebody with 25 year, years experience of growing cannabis. So um, that's an important component as well. And then, you know, the asset type will really vary by state. Are we doing a tuck in of, you know, one more dispensary for the market? Um, are we looking to go whole vertical, maybe looking for a larger acquisition in that state? So it varies a little bit by state, but, um, you know, we kind of look at everything out there. Um, and again, we're, we're remaining selectively acquisitive right now is probably the best way to put it. Okay, so sticking with capital expenditures, you know, apart from M and A, right? What are the calls on capital? Uh, you know, in, in your latest quarter, you talked about the investments in automation, you know, in some of your facilities. Can you talk a little bit about that? You know, what the expectations are, and then some. Of what are the other uses of capital in the near term? Yeah, so a lot of capex uh, planned for the year. We're targeting. Uh, 185 to 250 million for the year. Um, this is a little dependent on when um, our large acquisition targeting Q4 close actually closes, but um, we're investing a lot into the business right now. So, you know, on automation though, our founder heavily emphasizes efficient operations. That's kind of his bread and butter. He's built multiple successful enterprises and folding in technology where we can is, you know, definitely top of mind. Uh, just the other month, we were giving a tour of our New Jersey facility, and that included our automated pre-roll machine. And we're super proud to show this stuff because it's a newer technology that not many of our peers have yet incorporated. Um, and so the, the industry really holds a lot of automotive, uh, automation opportunities as technology built for the industry isn't really anywhere near what it is for, you know, like a normal medical or CPG company. 
Um, so, you know, we anticipate taking advantage of all tech advancements that we can. So another question from the audience, uh, just particularly on automation, and you talked about the preload. Can you go a little bit deeper and explain like exactly, just from a layman's perspective, like what that means? Yeah, so, uh, you know, one of our products, pre-rolls, um, what that means, it's kind of a, instead of buying a jar of flour, um, it's, you know, already rolled up. So kind of a ready to use product. Um, so typically what the industry is, is utilizing, these are all hand rolled and we certainly still have, you know, humans hand rolling to some extent and, and uh, you know, finalizing some of the products. This, this pre-roll pre machine basically kind of takes a funnel out of the paper, kind of stuffs it with some flour and we'll roll it up and tighten it up. So uh, it, it obviously is, you know, hugely accelerated to how many of those products we can get out the door per day. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a really cool thing to watch this industry kind of evolve across technology because, you know, of course, as you can imagine, we're still federally illegal. So there aren't a ton of companies putting a lot of, um, you know, capital into researching technology advancements. So where we can incorporate it is exciting and, and seeing it in person is really exciting. You know, it's just fully automated, all these cones going around, filling them and out it goes. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really exciting. Yeah, I think maybe the next time we host you guys, we should do like a virtual facility tour. That'd be Definitely. fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so let's let's back up a little bit, take out of a 10,000 foot level picture of you for people to get an understanding on what the market is. And so yeah. can you talk a little bit about in the U.S. in particular, you know, what is the size of the market? You know, where do you think Verano is now from a share perspective? You know, and where would you like to be or where do you think you can go both in the short term and the longer term? Sure. So uh, let's see, 2022 estimates for the U.S. put cannabis sales above $33 billion. Um, on market share, I mean, to be fair, California is a pretty significant portion of that market, and it is a market we have strategically avoided right now. It's nearly impossible, impossible to be profitable there um, for some reasons I had already mentioned. But um, forecasts for the country, you know, as a whole project very strong growth over $50 billion in, in 2026. So we see opportunities with new markets as we think there's a real first mover advantage um, in taking market share. So for example, getting into a state before, you know, right as going medical, growing operations and then being really ready once adult use passes or, you know, recently in Illinois, uh, it's about to release 185 additional dispensary licenses. And we see that as a fantastic wholesaling opportunity to gain some market share. So, you know, market share as a whole though, we, we don't really blindly seek market share at the expense of profitability. We, we tend to prioritize profitability, but um, we're seeing some, some really, a really strong pipeline and ability to grab further market share. Okay, great. And then, so we're kind of getting toward the bottom of the hour. And so I've got one more question and then I'll turn it back over to you for, for closing thoughts. If we get anything else from the audience, we'll ask that as well. Um, but, you know, the typical last question, you know, what, what are the two to three growth opportunities, right, that most excited you, you know, headed into the back half of this year, you know, and into 2023? Yeah, so there's a lot to be excited about. Uh, I'd say it's generally stemming from two areas. One, I would call it more organic growth from new states passing legislation. So either new medical markets or those states passing new adult use legislation. And two, from any movement in federal legislation. So regarding the timeline, though, since both of those are tied to legislation, I'm going to have to kind of take your timeline and throw it out the door because it's just so difficult to make a guess on when those things happen. Um, but again, we're seeing some really strong momentum to be excited about. Federal legislation can mean a ton of things depending on what is actually passed. So this could impact everything from ability to use credit cards. We are still restricted to cash only. So we would think if, if our consumers could use credit cards, we would see an immediate lift in basket size there. Advertising, um, hands are pretty much tied there, um, depending on state, but for the most part, pretty much no advertising uh, is allowed. So that could enable some more you know, organic consumer growth, letting consumers know how to use the product where you know where we're selling we're down the street uh and, and seeing it as a possible replacement for tobacco or alcohol i mean personally i think it is a fantastic replacement wednesday night coming home instead of my two glasses of red wine you know i can replace it with half an edible for virtually no calories and i can still wake up at 5 a.m and make it to the gym so um you know informing consumers on how to use the product um ease of banking you know getting uh more normalized credit rates and a possibility of an uplisting. So listing, you know, domestically on a US exchange. Um, but again, 
without any of this, we still have a very strong business. You know, we ended the first quarter with about 40% adjusted EBITDA margins, 140 million in cash. So, you know, the longer federal legalization drags on, the longer candidly we have to build a moat around our business. Um, you know, however, there's certainly a ton to look forward to and we, we welcome any progress on the legislative front. Yeah, and I think that's what's the, an interesting opportunity with the story, right, is everything that you're doing right now and organically, you're still putting up great numbers, but then there's optionality to the upside, right, should something happen on the federal level. Exactly. So that, that's pretty much all the questions I have, but I'll turn it back over to you, Juliana, for any kind of closing thoughts. Yeah, I, I, I would kind of end it uh, with what I just covered. We see tremendous opportunity in the business. You know, we are uh, operating a very strong business today. Uh, we prioritize pr profitability. There's a lot of strong growth opportunities ahead of us. And this optionality of any federal legislation really only creates a ton more uh, opportunity on the upside. As things stand today, we're, you know, as we, we like to put it, we're basically operating this business with our hands tied behind our backs. So if we're doing it successful today, we can't wait until uh, you know we see what tomorrow brings. All right, well, perfect. Well, thank you very much for the time. Yeah, and thank you for all the participants for tuning in today. Uh, look forward for the replays that will be available on the site for the next 30 days. And then join us on July 11th for our next Monday management update. With that, we'll say goodbye and see you next time. Thanks. Thank you.